Okay, good morning everyone. Let's start. Uh, so my name is Elena Camelingo. I'm one of the organizing of this workshop. Let me just, before I start my talk today, give me a, some explanation. Um, yesterday morning I received a call from Celso that he was in hospital. So he was the main speaker of the course and of course he's, he's, he's being operated today. So he cannot be here. He said a lot of, I'm sorry, but we have been planning this for about one year and unfortunately he could not come. So, but I think we restructure with also some other speakers volunteer to give another talk and we have a new speaker. So I think at the end, the course stays in a quite high level. That's what we expect. So I apologize for this, but this is things that happens and we just wish it feels better. That's all we wish. So this is the new schedule. So we're gonna do today morning. I'm gonna talk, uh, this is gonna be a very brief introduction. Maybe for some of you, it will be very basic, but we have a very broad types of persons attending the workshop, so I will do a review. It will be very basic for some, but not for others. So it's a quite introduction to combinatorial optimization in the, uh, and which is the main applications that we have. At the afternoon, we have IBM. IBM is going to introduce the CPLEX, one of the best uh, softwares that, in my opinion, to solve linear programming and integer linear programming. They are very nice to come here and give an introduction. There will also be an introduction for, from scratch, so I think you can follow all the talk, and then if you are a more advanced user, you can talk with them, and they have tutorials, and they have all kinds of supports. So tomorrow we're going to start already with the... Um, with the, with the talks, uh, we'll do the first one, so I don't have anyone coming early. Uh, Belen and Angel, Christian and Jessica will do the following ones in their specific topics. And then on Friday, we have a new talk, two new talks, Fatos and Angel, we do two new talks, and this will end up at, uh, at the lunch time. Okay, so we have the afternoon, for those who come from another place, so we have the afternoon free. Um, I, I would usually have my microphone here and I walk, but we are doing this in streaming, okay? So you can connect and see me. Hi, everyone is there. Uh, oh, it's over there, the camera. Uh, so we're gonna do this in streaming, so I have to use these microphones, okay? And then you have to, every time you talk, you have to use the other microphones so people outside the Pompeo Fabra can, um, can attend, okay? So the lunch is up to you. We have two cafeterias here in the campus and then you can go, there's a couple of restaurants around. So the lunch is it's up to you. We will start at three o'clock this afternoon. Okay, if you have any questions, then you can approach me um, during the, the breaks. For those of you enroll in the dinner, just talk with me because I have the number of dinners is very controlled because this is funded by another, another budget and we have to control very much the budget. So that's why we don't want to charge for inscription on the course, so our, special for PhD students and postdocs. I mean, it's nice not to have to pay a fee, right? So we, we have to control very much the cost so we, we, we can have it free for everyone, okay? So I appreciate you coming here. You are very welcome to the course. I think I'm gonna sit. I don't like this micro. I don't like to sit, but <laughs> that's what it is. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a very, very basic introduction, even try to explain what is operations research. So I'm gonna do a very basic introduction to combinatorial applica uh, optimization and applications, and special for those of you who don't come exactly from this field. Okay, so I'm gonna do what is operation research, what is analytics? Is that the same? Is not the same? The modeling process, what is the process, the methodology behind this, this, um, this area? And then I go on the combinatorial optimization problems and I will do the four basic problems in all, or at least the basic problems in this and talk about applications. Applications that I've developed, I work, applications that some of my colleagues uh, develop. If you have any question in any moment, you can interrupt me. 
just remember to ask me for the microphone, okay? So, what is operations research? So I have here a definition. It's a discipline of applying analytical methods to help to make better decisions. Is another definition is by using techniques which is as mathematical modeling to analyze complex situation, operation research gives the power to make more effective decisions to build on more productive systems, more complete data, consider all the options. So the idea here is that you get the data, you have a problem, use mathematical models and algorithms to propose a solution to propose a solution for this problem. And this is to help to make better decisions. So the main objective here is to really make better decisions. We can make decisions by intuition, that's quite common in business, or we can make decisions based on some knowledge, some mathematics. And that's the idea behind the operations research, okay? So in, 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 United, in United States, they call operations research. In UK, they call it operational research, which in Europe, sometimes they use operational research. And, um, and but this is the same. Also, some people talk about management science and analytics. Management science was operation research applied to business in the past, and operation research was operation research applies to engineer. So if you work in an engineer problem, you used to call operations research. If you work in a management problem, you used to call management science. About 30 years ago, 25 years ago, they decided this was the same techniques. It's just the problem changed. But the techniques are exactly the same. So the American society now calls INFORMS because it's operation research and management science. Because they put the both together. Later on, uh, the term analytics appears, which is much more popular today. Um, why is that? Because operation research, no one knows what it is. If you say, oh, I work in physics, maybe the person does not know anything about physics, but they say, oh, yeah, great, you're working in physics, wow. And they say, I work in operation research. The person say, look at you, say, what? What is this of operation research? It's a term that's, it's, the common society d does not recognize. Why is operation research? Does anyone know about operation research? Because operation research was born in UK during the Second World War. And it was the research of the military operations. So they did research to improve the operations of the, to win the war. So the name comes operations research and the name stays until today. But it's kind of abstract for people outside our area. Do you have this feeling too, that you say operation research and people say, what? Uh, okay. So the, the, later on the business, special IBM, decided to call it analytics. Analyze the data. Of course, we cannot do operation research without data. If we have no data, we have no operation research. So analytics come the term later on, and that's why they're coming analytics today. And in business, it's called business analytics. So they are very similar. Even you can find differences in the, in, in the, in, in the media. But at the end, they always do the same. It's using mathematical models and algorithms to make better decisions. That's the final idea, OK? So analytics, the, the, the informs define it as the scientific process transforming data into insights for making better decisions, which is basically very similar to operations research. It's always get the data, always have a problem, you apply a scientific method, a mathematical method to make better decisions. Okay, so this is a little bit the terms that go around. So for me, in my personal opinion, Operation research, management science, and analytics are exactly the same. And notice another difference between Europe and United States, especially Spain. In United States, statistics is part of operation research methodology. So if you go to an, an INFORMS uh, conference, you see a lot of statistics. In Europe, does not, they are separated. And in Spain, they are even, it looks like operation research is part of statistics. 
Okay, so it's, it's kind of war. But in the United States, operation research is really broad. Any technique that has some mathematics to make better decisions is considered operation research of business analytics. You see there's difference, cultural differences. And also in, in, uh, in business, what is business analytics? Another famous uh, term that appears today. I like this definition from Inform Society. For me, it's the one who represents better, that they divide analytics in three parts. The first part is descriptive analytics. So you analyze the data that you have, historical data, any data that you have in the right. Here you can find data mining, so some computer science techniques, and some statistics techniques. No? So you just analyze the data. So you treat the data, you clean the data, you obtain clustering from the data, you analyze what you have, right? The second step is predictive analytics. Predictive analytics, okay, I have this data, I am going to try to forecast what's gonna happen in the future. How is gonna behave my customers? Or what are they gonna buy my customers, okay? So here we have statistics, machine learning, and any of these kinds of things that's going around. Most of the companies, business companies, only discover these two, two parts, the descriptive analytics and the predictive analytics. They are here. But the next step is the most powerful one, which is prescriptive. Okay, I have this data, analyze the data, I know the forecasting for my customers, now I'm gonna prescribe, say what I'm gonna do to satisfy my customers. So I'm going to prescribe, evaluate future actions, new ways to really satisfy these customers. And here was the operation research and especially the metaheuristics appears very strongly. I can say like companies like Amazon are already in the prescriptive analysis. Some are most of the companies still in the predictive on the machine learning is the boom now. But they didn't discover, okay, I know what is gonna, you know, I know where my customers know how they'll behave, I know a lot of things, but how do you gonna organize your stocks? How many units are you gonna produce of this product? How are you gonna deliver it? How many machines are you gonna buy? How many people are you gonna hire? Okay, so the prescriptive analytics is, is where operation research come very strong, and as I said, is still not known by most of the companies. They will find out because in the past, many, many years ago, and if you are a little bit old, like me, I see a lot of young faces, the idea is having data. Oh, if I have data, it was fantastic because the companies don't have data. They don't collect data. Now we have data, you know, I can, you know, you, if you have an Apple phone, uh, Apple knows you are here today. If you, have, if you use Google, they know what you do all day around. Maybe your partner does not know and they know it, okay? The bank knows how much money you, you make and maybe your mom, your dad don't know how much money you have in the bank, but the bank knows perfectly what you buy, when you spend your money, everything, okay? So the data was a phase is like, like maybe 20 years ago is to get data, then we have data to analyze data, now we are forecasting and doing real strong forecasting, analyzing the, the behavior of our, uh, our customers, of what they do, if you are in Facebook, not in Facebook, everything. But then the next step is optimizing, is really to say, okay, well, I'm going to make this decision to really satisfy my cost. I'm gonna buy a new warehouse, I'm gonna hire more people, I'm going to design new products. Okay, so that's the next phase. So I like this, this one, and as I said, the third one is where we work, at least my group and some of the people that are here, and I think this is the future. Okay, let's see if this works, if I have a video. How do you visualize the scope of our increasingly complex world? Let's look at the size of the numbers. We now measure markets and competitors in hundreds, customers and citizens in billions, and daily bytes of created data in the quintillions. How can management win in a world with so many variables? The answer is operations research, applying advanced analytics for revolutionary gains in organizational performance. 
The Franz Edelman Awards celebrate the accomplishments of those who have achieved excellence in operations research. These leading innovators applied OR's 21st century technology to redefine environmental dynamics for greater sustainability, reimagine rail transit logistics, and revolutionize product supply and delivery. As the world grows more challenging, organizations like yours are innovating toward a better future. Operations research has a broad reach it offers higher profits and increased market share. And it has improved management in business, government, the military, healthcare, education, and nonprofits. And has applications at all levels of organizations. For example, OR has helped governments achieve environmental balance and sustainability alongside improved public health. When the Delaware River Basin Commission faced the challenge of maintaining reservoir levels for half of New York City's drinking water while protecting wild fish populations, they turned to advanced analytics. Their operations research solution used cost-benefit trade-off analysis to create the Flexible Flow Management Policy, a dynamic water release system to balance reservoir storage and wildlife needs. This created a 200% increase in trout and shad habitats with minimal impact on risk of drought in New York City. Applying operations research means recognizing the value of the minute, or in the case of the Netherlands Railways, the minute. Transporting more than 1.1 million passengers daily, Netherlands Railways needed to revise their 35-year-old railway timetable. To more accurately match trains to expected user traffic, the Dutch railway company adopted IBM's iLog optimization technology to improve train operations. Measuring variables like average boarding time and seasonal variations, Netherlands Railways applied sophisticated analytics to optimize their scheduling processes. Thanks to their OR solution, on-time train performance reached a new record of 87%, and the railway increased annual profits by 40 million euros. With fast data growth as the new normal, true management science pioneers will ensure data mastery throughout their organizations. Take consumer product giant Procter & Gamble, which posted $82.6 billion in sales in 2011. With too many manufacturing plants and a supply chain spanning continents, Procter & Gamble turned to operations research for their solution. Applying new operations research models created insight all the way up to the executive level, resolving product redundancies, navigating changing regulations, and consolidating factories across the United States. The result was more than $1 billion in cost savings over 15 years. As the world rapidly grows more intricate, operations research and analytics offer us the tools to master the complexity. This means agile business, streamlined costs, faster processes. These qualities illustrate the power of OR and analytics to navigate an ocean of information. And with the work of innovators like you, create a brighter future. Okay, so this is a little bit the introduction. I, I'm sure some of you work in operation research but never thought why you were here, what you want to contribute to this area. And now I think I, I expect you to give you this broad vision. So what is the methodology between, between operation research? What we really do? So usually you use this problem solving process, this methodology which is we explore the mass. So you have a problem, usually a real problem, and someone explain you the problem, and you have to optimize and get the best solution for some problem. Usually I put, I like this, this is from a book called Powell and Bakker, where they say a mess. Yes, usually it's a mess. Every time I go to a new company, a new business, I don't understand anything that exp they explain to me. I need a lot of time to process this mess. I think the most difficult for me was in healthcare. I was talking with doctors. I think the language is like, if he speaks in Japanese and I speak in Russia, it will be the same, because we could not understand what they say. After you clean a little bit the mess, so we need data, you need information, and then you need to classify, understand which problem is behind this, and that's what we already bring our knowledge. Oh, this is a location problem. This is a vehicle routing problem. Oh, okay, now I understand. This is. So we already bring our knowledge, and then when you structure the problem, we look for solution. And this is the main difference we use in operation research. 
We, we first represent the problem and then we solve it. Most of the people, even in your daily life, you understand and solve the problem at the same time. So if a friend is explaining to you a problem, you're already giving them solution. Oh, no, you should not go to that restaurant. It's too far away. You didn't listen all the story. We divide it and we really structure the problem very well and even put it in mathematics which helps really to understand the problem. Even when I work in metaheuristics, I like to see the papers with the mathematical formulation because that's where you really structure the problem. You understand all the details. And after that, we try to apply a solution method like an algorithm to solve it. After that, we have to evaluate the solutions. And for example, if you work with real data, a real problem, you bring the solution to, to, the, to the company and say, oh, no, 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 this does not work. I cannot send this driver to this direction because, you know, some, I'm going to give you a risk. I cannot send this driver to, to deliver to this sales point because they are, one is from Madrid, another is from the bars, and they spent two hours discussion the last night game, and the delivery is one hour delay. So, and okay, so we have to bring this knowledge again to the model and restructure the model. And finally, we put the solutions in the business. So this is my vision, a little bit. I should have this, okay? So again, we, it's interesting to have a real problem, to understand the mass of the real problem. Then you get the data, a lot of data analysis here. So we need a lot of people from data science that help us understand. Then we do the model, and here we bring our knowledge from the model. So I'm going to explain some models on this set of models that we can help us to structure this real problem. We bring our knowledge on solution methods to bring to understand the results. And when you get the results, sometimes we use simulation, and then we analyze this. And sometimes here it's okay. We have to bring back, go back to the model, go back to the data analysis, go back to things. Eventually we can create several scenarios. The sales are great, the sales are not great, the sales are really bad. What, is, what should my supply chain design in, in the cases of these three scenarios? And uh, finally, we make a decision. And I always say to the students that the difference between model and solution is very important. Because we do represent the model in mathematics. When we represent the mathematics, we completely understand the problem. And the simple, the model is the best. So not putting too much constraints and integ integrals of mathematics sophistication is not bad. There is also, I think there's a, a citation from Albert Einstein to say, the simple is the best, but it should represent the problem. Not too simple, not too much simple, but the simple the best. So this is what we're going to see. I'm going today to go an overview on this, and then, of course, we, we focus on the metaheuristics, which is one of the powerful most less known techniques to solve this sophisticated real problems. I like to put this citation from um, Frederick Smith, which is the founder of, um, of uh, Federal Express. As you know, Federal Express is one of the top uh, companies in this area of delivery packaging. And they say, I always make my mistakes on the paper. Before I implement something on reality, I make my mistakes on the paper. And here, I'm going to be very critical, especially with politicians. They always make the mistakes putting things on reality before they study. I'm going to do this super islands in Barcelona, and then let's see. Let's analyze what happens. And then it does not work. Then we change it. Then analyze again. And you are disturbing the life of people constantly. OK? So th this is one way to do it. And e with optimization methods, you already are quite confident that you do a good decision. Maybe sometimes you have to change, but you don't try in a Nero with life of people. And I like very much his, uh, his comments that if any person in his company, at least when he was the CEO, he has to bring some kind of oper operation research study before you implement it. He does not implement anything without an operation research study. What is a model? Another thing that I like to, to explain. It's a model is a representation of the real world. Everyone understands what is uh, uh, an architecture, what is a model. You're going to buy a new house, 
that is not built yet, and they show you a, you know, a design of what is going to be your house, and you understand that. That helps you. But it's not a real house, right? You go, you get the map. Now we have maps on your, uh, on your end. To get here, you look at the map to get here, okay? Which is now it's a better model than in the past when you have the maps on the paper, okay? Because it can even tell you the shortest path. So this model is better. But it's always a representation. It never represents the reality. And that's something for working with business that sometimes business people don't understand, okay? So it's very important to decide what goes on the model, what does not go on the model, okay? If you go to Boston, if you go to the Science Museum in Boston, there's a very, very, very nice explanation what models are for. And it's, it's, it's explained for kids, so everyone can understand it. This, for me, is the best, you know, exhibition I, uh, I found and get the model. So the model is a representation. What kind of models do we use? Mathematical models. We use a mathematical model. So we have to decide what goes to the model, what does not go to the model. This is a very important decision, and this is, you know, you understand this by experience. It's very difficult to say to the students, this goes to the model, this does not go to the model. It goes a lot by the, 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 the experience. But the model does help. You have, having a map did help you a lot of times, right? To go to somewhere. Looking to buy a new house, looking at the map, you say, okay, I can imagine how my house is gonna be. So models help a lot, and in decisions it also helps a lot, and also helps to think about the problems. So the model is valuable if you make better decisions, okay? And only try to solve the problem when you have the model. That's something that is very, very important. Even I, I, I have to teach sometimes for lawyers, and for them, some lawyers thought this is very important for me. Before I try to solve the case, I have to structure what the case was about. And this is not in many, many science, and we learn a lot of, about this up before you structure everything, and then you apply the algorithms. Then you apply the algorithms. That's, that's, that's an important aspect of the methodology. The algorithms, we have several types of algorithms. Efficient, very effective. For example, an, an, an efficient algorithm is that, okay, I need a solution in very short time. Does it have to be the optimal? If I give you five minutes to give you a solution, or even 20 seconds, maybe I'm on the phone with my customer and I want to give the solution immediately, I probably I don't get the optimal, the mathematical optimal. When I say the mathematical optimal, it's mathematically there is no better solution in the world than that, okay? So this is the optimal of heuristics. It's a big discussion. Some people are fan of optimal. Some people are fan of heuristics. Uh, both of them are tools, and if you get the optimal, it's fantastic, so you get mathematical proof that there's nothing better, but sometimes you cannot get the optimal. So what you do? You don't solve the problem, so the people that are very theoretical think, oh, if you don't get the optimal, you have to work to optimal. There's one algorithm for the traveling salesman problem, it took 50 years, 50, five zero years to be developed. If I go to a business, say, okay, Mr. Inditex, I'm gonna work on this, and in 50 years, I'm gonna give you the solution. Bye-bye, Mr. Ramalino. Come back next day, or never come back, okay? So uh, we have to understand this, so? So this is classification. Also, construction versus improvement. We will work in heuristic and improvement algorithms. Algorithms that, based on one solution, they try to improve. Sometimes we can go on uh, construction if you have really, really short time. And optimization versus simulation. That's a big discussion. A simulation does not optimize anything. Evaluates a situation, but does not give you the best. So I always, you know, especially when there is stochastic data, I always find that putting simulation after optimization is great. But only simulation, not. Simulation does not tell you what is the best solution. It gives you a lot of value, of course, to understand the system, okay? And I have this, since I'm in economics department, satisfying is more prevalent than optimizing in actual practice, and still is true, okay? This is still true. We have to satisfy. And remember, operation research was born by solving real problems. So if even there's, in some 
countries, they go away from reality, and that for me it's a mistake. That's why they are not applying. We, we solve real problems. Okay? So the first technique that we're going to see, the first types of problems, is linear programming. I'm sure that you have done this in, the, in, our, in your university when you did the undergrad program. So this is the most common, linear programming, and uh, uh, just a brief, that was a lot of applications on linear programming, it's probably one of the more mathematical modeling techniques. So what is the characteristics of the models when we use linear programming models? Linear programming models, we have two, three characteristics, okay? So we have a problem and we have to make the decisions. The decisions are the variables, are mathematical data. I'm going to build this warehouse or not? <coughs> How many units of this product I'm going to produce? Okay. Over these decisions, we have constraints. I cannot produce everything because I have some limits on raw material. Okay. And I have an objective function. Objective function is a function that measures how good my solution is. So me measure how good my solution is. So I need to measure. I need a measure of the solutions. Okay. And the nice thing about linear programming is that everything is linear. For my undergrad students, they, when they see, they get very happy. Okay. No integrals, no quadratic functions. Everything is linear. Okay. So this is an uh, idea of the, 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 math, the linear programming. Also, I can tell you once, I was, one of my colleagues was presenting a linear programming here, and someone in economics <coughs> says, since everything is linear, you can get the optimal very fast. You just derivate and that's it. No, no, no. We have constraints. We are minimizing a function, but we have constraints. So it's not just as simple as that. Okay. So, when you create a mathematical programming, you have, first of all, you have to understand very well the problem. So for my undergrad students, I, I force them to write down what the problem is by words. If you cannot write it by words, you cannot write it by mathematics, okay? Because mathematics is just like a translation from words to mathematics. So it's, if it's a translation, you have to understand perfectly. You have to define the decision variables, and that's not so simple in some problems, because especially when you talk with companies, they talk a lot about a mass, and you have to all focus what they really want to decide. And then, what constraints? Usually the constraints is, is quite easy, much easier than the decision variables for me, and the objective function is another discussion. What do you want to measure? Oh, I want to measure cost. No, but I want to measure profit. But I want to measure the number of uh, uh, engineers they have used this. No, no, come on. What is, you have to really specify what is the objective function, okay? So, as I said, my recommendation, always write the problem by words. Write really the problem by words. Answer question, what is the decision you have to take? Can you make quantitative? Because sometimes questions are not quantitative. How much do you like this, this person? But from, a, from zero to 10, how much do you like? That's what you have to. How much is this person good for this job, from zero to 10? So you have to make it all in numbers, because mathematicians like numbers. Then you have the constraints. What does constraints these decisions? And what is the objective function? When you have this by words, then you start with the maths. The maths, the variable, decision variables, the constraints, make a function that represents that constraint, make a function, then get the objective function, then you get the mathematical model. I don't have any mathematical model here. I will present you the ones from the combinatorial optimization. So as you know, uh, this was a problem is solved to solve linear programming. The, the original is dancing for 47. As you probably don't know the story, dancing is, was in California. He was invited to go to Washington to the military um, ministry, and they proposed them a problem, and I said, oh, I can solve it. When he was on the plane, he said, I don't know what to solve it. <laughs> So I'm in a trouble. I promised a solution, and now I don't know when it starts structuring, could not solve it. And then when it starts working on this. And in reality, 
this is called the simplex method. The simplex method is an heuristic method because it starts with a solution and goes from point to point, always improving, and when it gets to the end, it can, we can prove it's an optimal solution, but it's an heuristic in a way because it goes from improving, improving, improving from one to the another one. The thing is that we can prove it's optimal mathematically. And the advantage here, as you probably know, is because the set of the feasible solutions is a convex set. If it's not a convex set, we have nothing of this applies, okay? And, oh, this is not, then we have, there should be another PowerPoint here. I don't know why it disappeared. Yeah. So what happens in most situations is that the variables uh, so far in linear programming are real. You can take a real value, but most of the decisions you cannot take a real value. You take an integer value. Make or not make a warehouse, zero or one. How many cores I'm going to produce in SEA tomorrow? 5.3, and the point three, what is? Uh, who's gonna buy the point three car? No one. I can stop at the continuum another day, but in some cases I cannot. So most of the decisions are in teacher, and then it calls in teacher linear programming. Very original, in teacher linear programming. And with the year when we go to integer linear programming, we are, we are in another dimension. We cannot solve it with simplex methods because the set of feasible solutions is not convex, it's discrete. So we cannot solve it. We can enumerate all the feasible solutions because it's discrete, but we'll never finish. So we call something, it's called the branch and bound, which is based in simplex method. What we're gonna do is cutting this set of feasible solutions, making sure that we get all the integer solutions inside and eliminate the no integer solutions. I'm not gonna go inside this. There was a PowerPoint before I explained the difference in integer linear programming and linear programming. The function is still linear. It only changes the values that the variables can take, okay? And so the idea here is in, in the branch and bound cut is that we have an upper bound and a lower bound. You're trying to get these two together, and when you get these two together, you can prove the optimal solution, okay? So if you use a branch and bound, and I'm sure the, simple, the simplex method that the IBM colleagues are presenting this afternoon, sometimes you cannot just, you know, you cannot, it takes a long time, so you cut here, you finish your, your program here so you know the lower bound and the upper bound so you know what mistake, how far away you are from the optimal, okay? It's a little bit of the branch and bound. So we have integer linear programming, which is an extension of linear programming when the variables are take integer values. You can look at the, at the survey. There's a survey here from the informs that you can see all the solvers. There's lots of professional solvers. You can use it for small examples. For, for example, for my undergrad students, I use Excel solver. You can do it in Excel. So even a small company can do this because this solver is incorporated in every Excel, up to, a, I think, it's 500 variables, okay? But, but then we, if you want to go more professional, you can go in any of this. So this afternoon, we have CPLEX, ILOG, IBM, CPLEX, which is, uh, which is the, the professional solver to solve integer linear programming and uh, linear programming. Okay, any question? Okay, so we're going on the combinatorial optimization. What is combinatorial optimization? Combinatorial optimization are types of problems where you have a set of elements and the solutions are subset of these elements. Okay, a set of elements and the solution is subset of these elements and we want, we want the subset that gets the minimal cost, that is the best. Okay, so this is the combinatorial optimization uh, uh, problems. Many, many problems in real life are combinatorial optimization. Okay, 
many, many problems of real life and combinatorial optimization because you have sets of elements, sets of people. For example, we have a set of potential locations of warehouses and we want to locate five warehouses. So we have a subset of five warehouses that will locate the warehouses. Okay? And we want to minimize this. The nicest thing on combinatorial optimization that you can formulate them as integer linear programming or you can use graph theory, graph models, which are more visual, more nice to, to see, it. okay? Lots of combinatorial optimization. The traveling salesman problem is, is probably the most well-known problem, okay? You only know this problem, which is we have a set of cities you know, the distance between any pair of cities, you want to start a tour on the first city, visit all the cities and return to your original city, okay? There's thousands of thousands of papers and books dedicated to this problem, which in reality, I only have seen one application, which is on the, on the constructions of the computer equipment, where you have to link a, cer a certain kind of nodes, so the, the robots start on the link, has to link all of them, you know, and then finish. It's the only application, because real life applications are much more complex than the TSP. Okay, so reality is always more complex than, 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 than the abstraction. Then you have routing problems, location problems, scheduling problems, the other. So I'm going to go over these problems that some of you know quite well, but to have examples of what is combinatorial optimization problems. Applications, lots of applications. That's what we will look at some of them at the end. But I just put here logistics, manufacturing, transportation, telecommunications, health, energy, retailing. So that's a lot of applications in the industry, in the, in the sector of manufacturing, even services. Is, there has more applications on the manufacturing and logistics and transportation than, for example, in other service industries. My explanation is usually is the managers of these companies are engineers who knew about this. Even, in, even they have only one course at in their university, they knew about this. But for example, in health, um, I did some applications in health. I talked with doctors, medical doctors, and one time I did like a, a course, a course like this, but just applications on health. And all these doctors. Doctors are, and is any doctor in the room? No, <laughs> or maybe on, on there. Okay, <laughs> doctors are a person that know a lot of things. You know, and you respect a lot because they deal with your life in our health. So it's, you know, if I make a mistake, teach a really bad class, the effect will be not too big on my students, right? If that day I have a headache and I'm, you know, I, do, I don't do it well, my students will, okay, they will complain, they say I'm a bad teacher, but there's no much more consequences than that. But if a doctor has a headache and does something bad, I will complain. Because, so doctors are, you know, are people that know a lot. And, when they talk with you, it's very interesting because they wanted to understand, but they've never heard about this. They have no idea. So one of the doctors say, oh my God, and this exists? So I can, you know, I can push a button and have a system that solves this problem for me? Yes. And they was like surprises. But until you arrive to this point when they respect you, it takes some time. Okay? So that's why... Lots of applications in engineers uh, or companies with a lot of engineers, but not so much on services. On lawyers, I, you know, you cannot imagine when I, when I saw for lawyers. That was really, for me, uh, tremendous because I have no idea what a lawyer does. I mean, exactly. I mean, I can imagine, but it's not what they really do. So it's, it's very interesting. But, but little by little, people are recognizing the, the advantage of having this kind of systems, okay? This kind of system. And for example, for lawyers, what they won't really understand is the difference between modeling and solving. Even the, the algorithms that put it as they use have nothing to do with what we explain. But be able to restructure the problem before they apply the laws, it's, for them, was very interesting. Okay, so let's start with the facility location. This is a strategic decision. 
for most of the company. It's very important in logistics, telecommunications. It's basically the, pro the problem is, where do I locate? Where do I put my new facilities? I have to locate new facilities, new warehouses, new stores, new retailers, new factories. And for example, in telecommunication, new equipment, no? The new, this uh, equipment to do even modems and things like that, okay? Let's look at the logistics, the warehouse location. It's very interesting because some of these problems, they keep the name of the first application. So the first application, you, you, if, if you say warehouse location facility and you are locating stores or are locating uh, ambulances or are locating hospitals, but you keep doing the same name because it's like the same name. Because I mean on the, if you look, I mean this, I'm explaining you now this set of models, okay? So the model can have a name, and then I will talk about the, the real application. So the, the model can have a name. Okay? So usually you have a, a set of elements which are the potential locations for these equipments, for these warehouses. And you can have a set of elements that are elements that should be served by, the, by the, the warehouses, so the customers of these warehouses. And you can have a cost. You, usually here I assume there's two costs. One is a fixed cost for open the warehouse, and another is a transportation cost, okay? Where to locate these facilities, and which customer is served by each facility. For example, I can give you a real example, which is where to locate facilities to serve internet sales. I used to say to my students, internet sales, there is more physical things than things that you can download. Yes, now you can load, download the, 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 the planes and do a three print of your shoes, but you need the raw material. If you don't have the raw material, still don't come by internet. The music, the book, the airline ticket, yes. But if you look at the number of products that are selling internet, I think the last statistics is 80% are physical products and 20% are products that you can handle. So these physical problems need to be delivered. From where? Need to be in our warehouse. So where is our, these warehouses? Okay, and the cost could be transportation, warehousing, customer services. So we have several location models the most easy one is called the P-median. The P-median is to locate P number of elements. So P, sir, P warehouses. So I can locate three warehouses. I have budget to locate three warehouses. So where should I locate these three warehouses? So the number of elements to be open are fixed. Another one is, this, is the covering location. So this is a lot help, uh, for, for healthcare. Is that I wanted to locate my ambulances. So everyone in Barcelona is in 20 minutes, you can have an ambulance at their home. So they are covering areas. Or you can do capacity facility. Let's look at some of this. For example, the location of P facilities to serve and customers. Okay? This is very common, for example, for schools. I, want, I have budget to, to construct three new schools. Why should I construct these three new schools? Okay, which is the best location? Which customer should be assigned to which uh, warehouses? Okay, so let me explain a little bit the, the, the model. So to structure this, I use the model. So the model, the variables are binary. So I are in teacher linear programming, in this case, binary linear programming, which I have to decide in each potential location, I'm going to buy a, open the school, I'm not going to open the school. I'm open or not, okay? So typical mistake the students do is, is where to locate the schools? So what is the answer where to locate the schools? Is oh, in Gracia, in Poblino, but this is not quantitative. So my students make a lot of mistakes like this. You have to transform this in, in numbers, and that's real. It's open, do I open a school in Gracia? My answer is yes or no. Do I open a school in Pueblo? No, yes or no. This is, this is a number, know where to locate. And then which area goes to which school? Which area goes to the school if it's open? They say, oh yeah, but that's constrained. 
So I say I can only assign a neighborhood to a school that is open. This is a constraint. It's not on the definition of the variables. Okay? This is quite, sometimes it's difficult to see. So here you see the model is very, very simple. Okay? You want to minimize the distance from going from school I to J. So this is, I'm going a little bit more advanced here. Every area should go to a school or should go to be served. You can all only assign if it's open. So if the school is, this is a zero, this must be a zero. So I cannot assign an area to a school that is not open. And I have to open this number of, of things. So when I have this, now I, I, that I completely understand my problem. Okay? The maximum covering location model is, when we talk about location model, is always to locate new installation, new facilities, but now instead to minimize the distance, minimize the distance, the total distance, I want to minimize the covering, how far away, how much do I cover, right? So I have a number of locations, I have a number of population to be covered, I have the distance, and this is the maximum service time. I want the ambulance to be half an hour from every, I, I want uh, for every population in this area, okay? So the variables is again the same, yes or no, open or not open, and do I, this population is served by this center or not, okay? For example, an example of application here is done by my colleague Daniel Serra, who's done, who's done for the firehouses. So the firehouses in Barcelona, this was about 10 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, they were located historically, but Barcelona changed a lot, have been changed a lot. There's new neighborhoods, uh, new areas, and some neighborhoods were not, it were like about one hour away from the firehouse, which is uh, in one hour you can destroy all buildings. So we restructure all firehouses and say where you should locate it, even sometimes you have to close a firehouse to locate a new one. So where should the, the, the firehouse you locate it, so you should be at least 20 minutes away for every home in Barcelona. It's a very time. So here I have a similar formulation. You say, okay, I want the minimal number of, of firehouse because, okay, I can put a firehouse or everywhere, you know? If I have budget, I mean, so, but of course it's realistic that I don't have that budget. Uh, everyone should be covered. I can only assign a region to one that is open, so it's the same as before, but here I say, okay, <coughs> the distance for this must be less than the maximum distance. I cannot, you know, locate it, so otherwise if I don't put this, the solution will be, okay, locate one and that's it. Locate one and that's it. Locate one firehouse, but I need to do this. And this, this can be done for schools, we are applying this also for locating schools in Africa, where the kids have to walk a lot to go to the school. Okay, so this is the location model. And, but you see, this has a lot of constraints. So this is, this is a not so good formulation because I have a large number of constraints. If I have uh, 500 regions to locate and 100, so this is quite large. So, that to explain the difference between the models here, we have a different model which is much, much simple. We just have one type of variables, open or not open, and we only minimize the number of locations, but here say, okay, everyone should be covered by at least one warehouse. And this is, and I say, okay, here I have the list of all potential warehouses that are at, at this distance. And everyone should be, should have at least one that is in the closest distance. So this is a much simple formulation. Much simple because there's less variables, less constraints. So the CPLEX method or any professional method will run faster here, okay? So this is very interesting also to have this kind of formulations. And the last one, this is used a lot on supply chain, on retailing, and even on manufacturing is when you have capacities. We're not, we're not talking about capacities here. So how many students a school should have? How many, uh, you know, 
capacity of uh, a warehouse can process. So we're not talking about capacities. So here we incorporate the capacities. How many capacities? Does, what is the capacity of this warehouse? And again, it's the same. Is uh, is uh, where to locate? There's a, yeah, and here there is a fixed cost. In this simple case, I only put a fixed cost for each potential location. But I can even put some different capacities on the same location. Okay. Each customer must be served by only one facility, and each customer has an annual demand, so I know the demand of this capacity, of these customers, and there is cons capacity constraints. For example, the number of, uh, of uh, boxes you can prepare, or in case of students, the, the schools, the number of students a school can have, okay? So what is the best capacity? So we have, again, N retailers, in this case, the warehouses, the demand, the fixed cost, the demand capacity for the warehouse, and the, the distance. Here, I use the transportation cost to minimize. This simple example, this one, exactly this one, was used by Propter & Gamble to restructure all supply chain network in the United States. So in this video that you see the Elderman prices, they won a price because they saved millions of millions of dollars just because restructuring all the capacity. What happened in that business? During several years, Procter & Gamble all over the world have an acquisition strategy. They bought a lot of small factories. Okay, even here they bought for him Elena, the, this to, to wash, the washing machine, it was bought by Procter & Gamble. They bought a lot of factory, so that this distribution network became a mess. They repeat a lot, a lot of transportation. So they ask these people to restructure everything. This is a work done in 99. It was published in 99, it was done in 95. Okay, so they published five, five years later, so no one copies. Uh, and, uh, and the savings was enormous, enormous. And they used this model. Exactly this model, which is quite simple for us, for the ones who work for you. Okay, they use this model to restructure all their supply chain uh, network. Okay, so the idea is open, not open, the warehouse, and if a retailer is served or not. You see, the, the, the constraints are always the same. So the model, as you see, it's quite simple. Okay. You want to minimize the fixed cost. If you open, you pay a fixed cost. If you don't open, you don't pay. If you assign customer I to, to warehouse J, you pay a cost. If you're not, you don't pay a cost. So the cost is linear. You, every customer must be served. And here, you cannot pass the capacity. So the capacity of the warehouse, if the warehouse is open, if not, the capacity is zero, must serve the customers that are assigned to this. Okay. That's with, you know, as when I explain this here in the economics department, they don't understand that this simple problem can be very difficult to solve. Because it's linear, looks nice, it's clean, it's, but this can be, even location problems are among the comp combinatorial optimization problems, the simplest ones. Okay, and of course the variables are zero, one. And that's what makes things very complicated. No convexity, nothing, no nice properties here, okay? So if you're interested in location, you can have this two, the two working groups, one in the United States, the INFORMS and the European, when you can find all kind of resources about. I will put this available on the web if you want. I can put this available for you so you can. It's, there's nothing, no secrets here. This is common knowledge, even very basic knowledge. Okay, so this is the location. Another popular one that I see a lot of faces here that work on this is vehicle routing. Vehicle routing, as, as I start by, by this area, is what is a routing. I have to deliver something. I have to deliver products. And this, with e-commerce, is becoming a nightmare for, for companies. It's becoming one of the key factors to be successful or not, because this is a large cost. To have an idea, if you buy on internet the supermarket, a delivery costs about 15 euros. They do about 20 deliveries a day, minimal, 
and you can imagine how much does it cost to truck and a driver for one day in Barcelona, okay? Costs uh, 200, 300 euros a day, more or less, okay? So if you do it well, you can save a lot of money. So here it's not locating, you already know where the warehouse here, and let's assume I'm, I'm going to spend the easiest one, which is locating, what, what, there is one warehouse, and we have several customers that you have to, to deliver some product, or sometimes even collect, you can have and collect. For us it's exactly the same. There's some applications in telecommunications, routing, because your, your messages go somewhere. When you send a message to, your, a message to a friend, your message must travel on the network. There's similar problems in the, in the telecommunications, but I like to explain more the logistics one because I think it's simple to understand. So you have a set of customers that you know what they are. The customer has a specific demand. The routes, I'm gonna assume that start to finish in the depot. If it's not, it's basically the same. And the objective is minimizing the cost, the transportation cost that can be related with the distance, okay? Notice that in the past, when there was no internet sales, the stores are always the same every day. So you can do a pretty good job because the stores are always the same. Today, with internet, every day they have a new set of customers and a very demanding customers. The studies in marketing say that the, the internet customers, like myself, are very demanding. If I say they can arrive from nine to 10, if I'm at 10 o'clock they are not there, I'm already entering my computer and making a complaint. They say, Dell as a statistics, they say people look five times a day, five times a day is where this computer is, on average. So there's people that don't look and there's people that look 20 times. So if you order a computer in the store, you don't go five times a day asking, oh, is my computer? Did you build my computer? Some companies, like some car manufacturing, I put in cameras so you can see your car being manufactured. They send you a message, say your car is starting to be manufactured. You can click this link and with cameras, you can see your car and you can see people putting things in your car, okay? So the internet customers are a nightmare and they will not become better. They will become worse. Worse in the sense they will be more demanding. So the company that can serve this will be the winners, okay? So this is, that's why this routing problem, especially in the internet and in companies like Amazon is becoming crucial. So I'm gonna show you two formulations of these ones. So I'm gonna sum data here. So here we have a set of customers. Zero is the, the warehouse. Let's assume only one warehouse. Okay, just for simplicity. There's vehicles that are equal, which is not real, but we can overcome that. You have a specific demand. Notice that this demand is not the book, it's the space that the book occupies. Okay, and in some companies, like for example in Inditex, the boxes are all the same size. So you can say that a truck can get 100 boxes, okay? So it's in some cases. And the objective is total distance, minimizing the total distance. Okay, so we have two types of variable. One of them is if you use, if you use a vehicle or not, if, or many vehicles, so you have vehicle or not, you can assume a, num a maximum number of vehicles, okay? Even if you have like, five vehicles, you can optimize it with more and then see if I don't have more, I can do two routes. And if a customer is visit immediately after other customer on this route. So this is what constructs the route. Another important thing to define well the variables is that I used to say to my students, if I give you numbers here, you have a solution for your problem. You can recover your solution. So that's, 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 so the variables are well defined, you didn't miss anyone, okay? And then we have this model, now it's not so nicer. So let me explain a little bit, okay? Minimize the distance. Okay, if vehicle I and J are connected by, by the, I, if customer I and J are connected by vehicle chi, so if this is a one, you pay a distance. This is a zero, you don't pay a distance. That's very simple. 
Here, every customer must be visited. So you have to deliver off the package. Otherwise, you have, like myself, complaining. Okay? All vehicles come out of the warehouse. Okay? You cannot pass the capacity of the vehicles. You cannot pass the capacity of the vehicles. That's very common. And now we're coming, these ones, it's quite simple. Say, so, okay, if vehicle is, customer I is visited by vehicle K, he must, the vehicle must enter customer I and must leave customer I. Okay, it must come from somewhere and must go to somewhere. That's what this constraint is saying. It cannot stop at customer I and stay there. It must go. And this is the most complicated. This is not at all intuitive. I don't, no, I don't have a board. Okay. Uh, so this is not, this is the, the tricky ones. The tricky ones is saying that the route starts and finish at warehouse. You cannot have routes with customer one, two, and three, and you, one, two, and three, two, and two. We call soup tours. So this is the most complicated one. And that's, for example, if you use professional software, you see there's an exponential number of constraints because this must be done per all subsets of the, of the customers. So all subsets of the customers is an exponential number of constraints. And then here, it's, that's what things make complicated, okay? And of course, you can solve this. If this one, you can already, you solve it in professional software with 100 customers can take you a couple of hours if you have a normal computer, if in a good computer, but not a super computer. But in reality, you have, for example, in one company that we, ha we work was 400 customers and we have five, 10 minutes to solve the routing. So no professional software uh, up to now exists that can solve this in 10 minutes. That's why we need meta heuristics. So there's no professional software so far. If you have 400 customers, you need 10 minutes. Why 10 minutes? So when you order a product, how long does it take you to deliver to your home in internet? Now, what they promise to you? 24 hours. Two hours. But two hours is becoming uh, in, uh, now. Many companies, like for example, Inditex, in some areas are promised if you order in the morning until 12 o'clock in the morning, they deliver it to you in the afternoon. Some are going to two hours. So these two hours, they have to look if the product is available in the warehouse if they don't have a good system to control it, which is not the case. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Pick the product on the warehouse. Warehouses are really big. So, for example, in the text warehouse, it's like 10 times the, the, the soccer field of Barca. 10 times. Okay? And there's one which is 20 times. So, picking this takes time. Putting in a box, fold the box, put it in a truck, and deliver it to you. If you have 12 hours, to have two hours, how many times do you have to, to, to optimize the routes? Five minutes. Think about again in the text. They have stores all over the world. They have a 36 hours delivery promise to the stores in Japan or Australia. How much does it take a flight to, to Australia? More. 24. It could be 30, depend which company, because there's no direct flight so far. So now you take, so take 20 hours, pull. The, the time to prepare, put the time to pack the package on the truck, deliver to the, to the, to the so for example, they, to Japan, they fly out of Hamburg, they prepare the, 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 the orders in uh, Saragossa or in Artesia. So you have to drive from Saragossa to Hamburg, put it in the plane, fly in the plane, get out of the plane. So you see, that's why it's, you need it a very short time. So cool. With the location, say if I'm making a, a decision on location, I can you know, put the computer working 24 hours and, you know, and then give me a solution and then look at this, analyze, and, but with this, I cannot. Okay, so that's where we enter the meta heuristics. Okay. 
So I can have another formulation. Formulation as a set covering. This is a different type of formulation. We use it a lot for combinatorial optimization. Some, some structure came out wrong. It's like, okay, what I do is I pre-generate all possible combinations of, uh, of roots. I have a big, huge set of combinations of roots. So I already have this subset, and then what I'm going to do is select the best combinations that minimizing the cost. So I have a pre-processing that is done. It takes a lot of time, lots of time. But uh, then I have a very simple mathematical model. This in the past was very used because my locations of the customers are fixed. Now it's not used anymore because my locations of customers are new every time. Okay? And then you can use even column generation and you can solve. But now you cannot solve routing like as simple as this one. Okay? So, and then in routing, there's many, many applications. I would say that's probably on the top three number of modeling applied to reality because you can have vehicles with different applications. You can have time windows. In, in internet delivers, we have time windows. I want to deliver from 9 to 10. Anna wants to deliver from 11 to 12. Carlos wants to deliver from 11 to 11.30. So you have time windows that you have to deliver. You have pick up the delivers at the same time. This is for, pa uh, for packaging is quite relevant. You have reverse logistic. This is a night, an another nightmare because a reverse division, you don't know the demand until you arrive. And if you're picking from, the, from the, the beans that are on the street, you don't know if they are full or not. So you don't know you, the, how many capacity you're going to use of your truck. Uh, you have uh, vehicles with multi-depot. So we have a lot of extensions that I can tell you that uh, every routing problem is a new problem. And then you can have an extension like you also consider inventory routing problem. For example, for vending machines, that you have to optimize the inventory and you have to optimize the routing. Okay, so you don't want to visit the vending machine if it's still full. And if it's empty, you want to go fast because otherwise you lose sales. So when to visit these customers, now we have when to visit and how much to deliver and on the routing. So we have a lot of decisions to make. So this is called inventory routing problem. And in retailing, this is a, happens a lot. I don't know if you know that on a normal supermarket, the traditional way is that the, the manager of the supermarket places the order. Oh, for tomorrow I need more milk, I need more sugar, I need more whatever. Okay, and then there is a list and they serve from the, from the, from the warehouse of this supermarket. Now, for example, with Danone, this is happening a lot of time, the delivers of Danone I, I don't go to the warehouse of the supermarket, they go directly from the warehouse of Danone. And it's Danone that decides how many products to deliver in the supermarket. So Danone negotiates a space, say, I want five shelves, this area for me. This is my Danone space. No one can use my Danone space. And the Danone company decides which yogurts, which products deliver that. The supermarket just, you know, receives a percentage of the sales. This is called vendor management inventory. So it's the manufacturer that decides how much units to, to this. So this is, this is inventory routing that goes behind that, okay? And the studies say that if you the manufacturing manage the inventory, the sales increase. They make more money. The supermarket and the, and the manufacturing. Okay, okay so uh, uh, this is another area also which inventory management. I give you this web page which have lots of information about this problem that been solved quite a uh, lot of applications. Then it comes the third group of problems in community optimization, scheduling. Scheduling is probably the most difficult one. Today we don't have time, but I used to have an exercise that you have to schedule nine uh, tasks on the machine, and no one never could get me the optimal solution. Never. By hand. Never. So again, the main applications here was in manufacturing. That's why we call about machines and we talk about jobs. But these machines could be airplanes and the jobs could be people. 
So there's a lot of applications. The machines could be operation rooms in a hospital and the jobs could be fake people. So, but as I said to you, the names stay from the first application. Okay, so the idea is that you have resources with limited capacity. And you have a lot of tasks that these resources have to perform and you have to schedule these tasks along a period of time. Okay, so this can be the the course, course uh, scheduling, which is uh, most of the universities do it by hand. No comments. Okay? And I've seen them, a lot of companies do it by hand. My experience is when we apply these techniques, you have two great benefits. First of all, you save money. And second, you have people more happy don't have to teach until 8 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, for example. So uh, this is, could be strategic, it could be operations. Companies that use this, mostly manufacturing companies and airline companies, <coughs> because a plane is one, a very expensive resource. So using badly a plane, this is tremendous. And this is, for example, also for low-cost companies, they have two among others, things that are very important. They, the planes are all equal, so any pilot can drive any plane, which that all happens in, in the traditional companies. And second, they schedule that the plane always sleeps on the home ho uh, host. So they don't have to pay extra money if the plane sleeps. So if we fly from Barcelona to, to GFK, Iberia is not, the host of GFK is not Iberia, so they have to pay more money there. Okay, so scheduling is more important, and as I said, for me, it's the most difficult one to solve. Even small instance cannot be solved exactly. You have very limited resources, so limited resources is always, I don't know anyone who has unlimited resources. Well, yeah, some, some rich people, but even that are limited. They can spend all the money sometimes. So, and the objective is basically of minimizing the costs, minimizing the completion time, doing it as fast as possible, minimizing the working process because of working process, you already invest money, but you don't recover any money. Maximize the utilization of the equipment. For example, this is in service hospitals. This is very important. You buy a very expensive equipment. If you use it every day, you recover that investment faster. And minimizing the customer waiting time, which is also it could be an example in hospitals. So. As I said, for the goals of scheduling, not only you do advantage on costs, everyone can understand costs, it's a best customer service. The customer service is so important today that if you do a good customer service, this can really be a competitive advantage. And, I, and I've seen it many times that good scheduling make a competitive advantage, make people more happy, make people be served, so they really increase as a company. Let's look now at the classification of the scheduling models. Uh, there's three things that I want to say. One is the type of machines. I put machine, but it's the type of resource, the processing characteristics, and the objectives and performance measures. So machines could be one machine. Okay, so for example, examples, I have a satellite that has to take pictures. And I want a picture from Europe and then a picture from Hawaii. So I have to move the satellite. I have to wait. Okay? So this is one machine. This is an example. Parallel machines is, the, is when we have machines that you can put a task on one machine or another because they are equal. For example, could be uh, in a course scheduling. Okay? I put my course in room number one, room number two. If they are equal, I can do it both. Flow shops is a production line which every job has to go through the same sequences of machines and job shop is an extension of flow shop that not every job has to go through every machine yeah, and it can go in different orders okay the processing characteristics could be precedence constraints okay uh, I can only paint the walls after I build the walls so I cannot do painting before I construct the walls Routing constraints that some sequences of the job must be specific. Sequence dependent setup. So if I paint in white and then I paint in black, I have to clean the machine in the middle. Okay? 
That's why in, in car manufacturers, they start painting in white and finish in black. They go in darker, darker, okay? You can have preemption. Preemption is when you can allow the interruption of the task and continue later. So for example, in course uh, scheduling, you cannot do this. Okay, I, I teach me, me half an hour, now interrupt my class, and then I continue later. Okay, so you have the task, is, you have to do it in a row. Tooling constraints is when you need different tools. Okay, this could be in, in uh, operating rooms. If I, if I do the same, if I schedule the same type of operations all together, and I use the same tools, I don't have to put in and put out tools and lost time. And then personal scheduling, which is, you know, scheduling the, the, the personnel is it's really important. I'm going to go over the, so this is just notation, number of jobs and machines, there could be release times, the time that, you know, the, the job is available, delivery times, priorities, could be jobs that are more priority than others, for example, in, in hospital scheduling, this is quite important, and completion time. So the objectives could be, I want to finish as early as possible. Okay, this is in the hospitals, it's very important. I want to schedule such that I finish as early as possible. Course scheduling too is another objective. I want to schedule that I finish as early as possible all my jobs. Could be, I, I, could be like if I have a, a due date, I want to minimize my, if I get late, the quantity that I get late. I want to minimize it. Okay, if everyone wants a project for, if all professors ask you a project for tomorrow morning, you'll be late in someone, okay? Or the tardiness, which is in, the, in lateness, I, mean in my, I, I, I penalize if I'm too early or too late, and tardiness only if I'm late, okay? Just, just give you ideas of objectives. So let me give you the job shop scheduling example, which is the most complex one, which is I have a set of jobs, they have to be done by a set of machines, okay? Schedule these jobs on these machines and I want to minimize the make span. Make span is the maximum completion time. So the, I want to finish as early as possible. That's what I want, okay? So each job, each job is divided in different operations and I can say, okay, for this job, this operation is done by this machine. This operation is done by this machine and this operation is done by this machine. So. Okay, so I, I, each job has to go through all these three machines, but I have to go first to this one, second to this one, and third to this one. I cannot go first to this one, and then to this one, okay? So I have a sequence that I have to do it. Okay, for example, even in, in medical, that exists. Now first you have to do an analytic, and then you have to do this, and then I have to do this, okay? So uh, the constraints are very simple. Each job can only be at one machine at a time, and each machine can only have one job at a time. So it's one to one, okay? And no preemption. I cannot be in the middle of operation and say, okay, now I open your stomach, now you go away because there's someone more urgent coming. No, that's not possible. You would not like to, that someone did this to you, okay? So at the end, we end up something like this, which is a Gantt diagram. A Gantt diagram is the visual for the solution, but it's not a methodology. It's just you look for this, okay, I say job three goes to machine one, then go to machine three, then go to machine two, and then to machine three. See, for example, here there's an empty. So if you are smart, you can do, for example, programming uh, some maintenance here, okay? So you can, and this is the time you finished, okay? This is the Gantt chart, which is a solution for your your problem. How do you do this in mathematical formulation? Uh, that's what I wanted to show it to you. So again, here we have a, a variable call. It's a, a decision variable, say the time that this operation of this job starts. I have the time. So if I know the time at each operation starts in this machine, I can draw the solution. I can draw the solution. So that's my variable. Okay, and I have the completion time. I don't need this exactly, but I need it just to make the formulation simple, that's all. So I want to minimize this completion time. Okay. So for the same, this one, for the same, for the same job, I know the second operation must be done after this, the first. 
I know that. I cannot do the second operation before that one. Okay? So this is my first constraint. Okay? But for the same machine, for the same machine, yes, I can do job one first and job two. Or, or job two before job one, or job one before job two. I can do both. I cannot do it at the same time. I they cannot overlap, but I can say job one is before job two in this machine, or job two is before job one in this machine. One or another, okay? So here I have this or this, okay? And this is the completion time. This makes me the completion time. But this or this is not linear, okay? So it's, I have a mass here. So I have to transform this in a linear. And what I do is like putting a variable, say, if job one is first and job two in the machine something. And then I transform the linear and I have a huge, a huge, huge uh, lin integer linear programming, which is, as I said, if I put it in a computer with 10 jobs and 10 machines in my computer, which is quite good, it takes me eight hours to get the solution. So, very complicated, okay? Very complicated to solve this. So we need metaheuristics in, in most of the cases. And this is a simple problem because now if I put tools, if I put a lot of things, you can see that this model becomes very crazy. So to finish, to finish the models, I have the clicks. The clicks, it's a very funny because it was a problem that was studied. It was not very much applied and now it's becoming very, very much applied because it's applied to social networks and to marketing a lot. What is a click? Let's see, I'm gonna put it here. Here's the definition, but I'm gonna jump to the mathematical definition. So I have a network. I have a network with nodes. I have links. And I want to construct the larger set of nodes that everyone is related to everyone else. Everyone is related to everyone else. So here you have this tree. There's more, okay? But that you cannot find a set of four nodes that everyone is related with any, everyone else. This is a click, okay? So it's a set. C is a click if exists all connections between all the elements in the, in the network. Okay, so you can see, for example, the, the, the most important people on the, on the network that are related to everyone. Okay, maybe you want to contact one of them because they are related with the top guys, more related with everyone else. Okay, so the formulation is very simple. If a node is the click or not, okay, you want to minimize the number of nodes that are in the click, but then you want to make sure that the ones that are, that in this set, there is no link missing. So the, the formulation is very funny because I say, I and J does not exist, so this cannot be both, cannot be on the click. Okay, if, if suppose I and J are on the click, so the link between I and J must exist by definition. So this must be, if this, this, must, this will be two, but if it does not exist, this cannot be two. It's just you, do the opposite and idea. Wow, it's, but you see, it's very simple. It's a very simple formulation, and this is NP-hard. This is difficult to solve in linear time, okay? Then you have the maximum weight click, where you can put weights on the weight, on the, on the, on the, on the nodes, which is very similar. So click is, you can put weights on the, on the edges, okay? So you can put weights. So here you have weight, so this is the click that has massive number of nodes and the largest weights, okay? And you can see the cut click. That's, I'm, I wanna go this to give you an example of applications on, on marketing. So the cut click is a click, but it's a click that has the massive external links. So for example, here you see a click with four, with one, two, three, four, everyone is connected. But the external is one, two and three. But this with only two, they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? So in marketing, we use a lot of this, the maximum cut click, okay? I'm not going to the, to the, 
to the formulation, which is much more complicated than the other one. Okay? So let's go on the applications now. Let's look at some several applications in these areas, okay? Some, some I work myself, some work my, of my colleagues. Okay, retailing. In retailing, we use a lot of routing, a lot of routing. Optimizing picking routings in a warehouse, optimizing delivery. So the routing, the picking, okay, for example, I can give you the example in the text. Half a million orders to prepare in 24 hours on Black Friday, and you have to deliver this in 24 hours. So you have to do the picking, the way you walk on the, on the warehouse. Saving one minute in each route at the end of the year is lots, lots of money. Planning the distribution routes delivered to the houses of people, to the stores, every, as I used to say, every truck you see in the morning going around, that's a routing. Someone has to plan that routing. Well or better, someone has to plan. The store warehouse location decision. Inventory, where should I maintain my inventory? Should I have inventory in every place? Some places. So for example, El Corte Inglés, should I have all products in every warehouse in Spain? Or, you know, I can have some products in Zaragoza and I'll not have any in Madrid and Barcelona because the demand is very low and where do I locate this? All my this inventory decision. Routing decisions. I'll give you examples of this. Uh, and this is an example that we've done for Bonaria. Okay, we have different types of vehicles, time windows. The, the, the stores have time. So, for example, you don't want to deliver when to a store when is the peak of, of customers go to that store because that is not good. You have the trucks coming in, the stores are very small, the stores are very small, so you don't want to have the pallets going in and go out when you are delivering, when there are customers there. Massive driving hours, multi-trip, so we have a lot of things. The savings here, uh, it's quite a lot of money. I cannot say it, but it's quite a lot of money, a lot of money. 400 stores at the moment we did the study. Every day, deliver every day. So that, that business strategy is that, is a fresh product that is delivered every day. So if you go a Saturday afternoon to this bon area, probably is almost empty. That's their objectives, okay? Home health care, I've done some work, and Angel Juan who's presenting also done some work on this. You can do the attention, medical attention at home. So what my colleagues in, in uh, health economics are saying is that first of all, it's less expensive to have people be attended at home that bring them to a hospital. Suppose you have can uh, go to operations and every day they have to change your, you know, clean your home and clean things. If you have to go to the hospital, this is very expensive. It's much better that some uh, nurse goes to your home and do this. And it's less risky. Because in the hospital, you always get an infection, you can get the virus, so it's, it's less risky. So uh, it's becoming more and more that we have this attention to this medical attention at home. And then we are trying to do a project with Barcelona also for social attention, for people who are in social difficulties, have a social specialist going their home. Location of medical resources, um, hospital ambulances, and this. I think politicians should pay attention to this because sometimes you don't have to open hospital everywhere and do all service everywhere. If you do it well, you can serve well the customers. Planning emergency services, this was done by my colleague Jessica, who is here. Well, where to put the emergency equipment to, to really attend people faster. Optimizing the location of preventive health care service providers, you no, know, to, to prevent. And this is a nice one that I'm in a, in a European, uh, European project, which is the matching of kidney exchange. So I, if I need a kidney and you know, no one in my family is compatible with me, so, but someone is willing to put a kidney, so some of my family gives a kidney, I need a kidney, so there's a matching that now is done in, in, in your country and we're trying to do this in Europe, okay? In Portugal, they implement uh, one program by my colleague Ana Biana and they increase 50% of the, the survival on the kidney exchanges, okay? It's very interesting. In transportation, okay, so I can already talk about trans air transportation, assignment airplanes, it's very personal. Personal, you know, every company has a personal cruise scheduling. Okay. 
for to, to do this because pilots, the, 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 scale, the, the crews, the human resources in airlines are very, very expensive. I've done a project for, uh, for um, buses in Portugal to assign pilots, drivers to the buses. It's sustainable transportation, okay, so if you do plan well, you can be much better for the environment. Horizontal corporate cooperation, so this is a project that Angel has done quite well with me, is how do you collaborate so do I need to have a truck coming up? A truck of donuts delivered to Pompeo. Then it comes a truck of, uh, uh, I don't know, Coca-Cola. And then it comes a truck of coffee. Can we put just all together and have one delivered at the, the cafeteria here and one truck? Better for the traffic, better for the environmental, better for everyone. Why do I have to have 20 trucks coming to the same store? Okay. Location of the transportation hubs, which is a reality location. Optimization maritime transportation, we have a specialist coming tomorrow explaining this from uh, Canarias. Optimization electrical vehicles or the location of SARS stations. There's a project in Germany, I think Angel is working on this, where to locate these charge stations. Because most of the time we don't buy electrical car. You know, I, I have no station close to my home, so how can I charge it? So this is very, very interesting. Uh, Germany is really leading this. Logistics supply chain, I already explained about the design of the supply chain, Procter & Gamble. Optimization city logistics, for example, optimizing these deliveries, optimizing the pu public transportation. I would like to also to talk about humanitarian logistics. There's a big group working on humanitarian logistics when there is um, like a earthquake or something, I'll do the put this available to everyone. Where to locate, for example, in, in South America, most of them are located in Panama. In, why not in IT or this area which are more hurricanes? Because of course, if you have a warehouse in a place where the hurricane is gonna happen, it's useless. You must locate it in places that you arrive early and reverse logistics, garbage collection. It's really, really interesting things. Design reverse logistics is very different from research or design forward logistics. So this is also enormous applications here. In scheduling, production scheduling. It, this is area, how do I produce my product? What is the sequence? The sequence is so fundamental to do a good, to finish early, to do more products. Inventory management, okay? Zero stock does not exist. It was a theory in the past. Zero stock does not exist. Someone has to have stocks, but maybe we need less stock. Lot sizing, cutting and packing problems. So in manufacturing, there's a lot of applications. On the, on the clicks, on marketing. So I'm gonna explain the market basket analysis a little bit. Optimizing target offers in marketing campaigns, okay? Segmentation, site location analysis. So in marketing, is still, if you want to do a PhD in this area, is still, I'm trying to convince someone, because they still didn't get the optimization side. They are still on the prescriptive, predictive side, but not the prescriptive, okay? And I even read some papers say, this is, cannot be done because it's too much combinatorial. Mm, I said, no. Nope. It can be done. It's just like not with the techniques that you are using, but it can be done. So, for example, this is a network. So, let me explain a little bit about the basket network. That's a work we've done for UK. Every dot, every node is a product. And there is a link if someone puts this product together on the same basket. So, you go to the supermarket, you put beer and chips on the same basket. Okay? Most of the past, people are looking for the central node, the ones that sells more, which is this guy over here. Yeah, this can be done easily, can be calculated easily. This is the, my, and I do campaigns on this so I can look at more influences. If I do the maximum click, look is here. Okay, they are all connected to each other but not connected with the rest. So I'm looking to the maximum cut click. Okay, I'll give you another example. So this is the Martin Carnial kick, the Martin kick. Why marketing did this? If I do a campaign on this three, on this, on this, what, sorry, on this six, I influence all of that. I reduce one cent, 10 cents of this, 
and I increase these one cents and I make money and I sell more. Okay, this can be done for, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do this for Facebook. What are these guys? I can influence one of these guys because they are top, they connected to each other and then I influence all of this just by influencing one of this, which is a bigger impact than just the central node. They're still on the central node. And I've read it in an article say this cannot be done. Yes, not so simple. It's much more difficult because this is combinatorial, so it's not one point. So this is a lot of marketing implications, that's what I explained. And there is more and more applications. Crew scheduling, water resources, revenue man in finance. Lots of applications in finance. The only thing is in finance sometimes is not linear. So the functions are not linear. In sports application, that's one that I love. And I have a friend, you know, these games that you construct your team and then they play. He constructs a team like this with a very low budget and he won because he optimized. You know, in NBA, in, uh, in basket, uh, American football, um, baseball in the United States, they are using a lot of this. In the summer, there was supposed to come one of my colleagues which is an expert on this on getting data and really, especially in baseball, because the sequence you put the, the, the batters, it's very important. In, in soccer, I can say you are in the, in the middle age in soccer. Uh, you know, I love soccer. Some people do some of this data, um, data science, but not optimization, no. So in, in basketball, in, in American soccer, uh, the American football, they're doing a lot. Timetabling, I already mentioned. I cannot imagine, and I know, many universities are doing the schedule by hand. It's crazy. So this is lots of applications. Okay, so I finished my talk here. So it's prescriptive analytics is the next step on analytics. Many, many real life combinatorial optimization. If you're doing a PhD, Real life is much more challenging than work again on TSP. In TSP, you have lots of people, smart people working on this, so it's very difficult to build on this knowledge. It's still hard to solve a large combinatorial term. Today, we have the IBM explaining how large they can solve it, but in some real cases, I still need the meta heuristics. And remember, it's get value and insights and data to make better decisions. That's, 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 and we need data. We have to get this value out of data. Today, fortunately, we do have data. Maybe not every data we want, but much, much more than in the past. Okay, so I finished my talk here. Any question? No questions, come on. You are worse than my students. I always want my students to be like my kids and make me 30 questions in 10 minutes. Questions? Yeah, good. Hi. Uh, in all these applications you have shown, um, they, so which would you say is the percentage of meteoristics versus integer programming, or how do you typically solve them in a gross number? Okay, so in most of the times, if you can use integer linear programming, you use it. But in real problems, I, I, don't, I didn't see much. Just, I don't know, percentage will be difficult, but maybe 30%, 40%. And we do use integer linear programming because we need to evaluate the quality of the heuristic. So to evaluate how, if our heuristic is good or not, for small instances, we do use integer linear programming. For example, example one paper that I have for uh, collecting blood sample. So you go, you go and you have a, a blood extraction and this has to go to the laboratory. And now for several reasons they, they are creating big laboratories because of the equipment is very expensive so they are going out of the cities. They go to outside the city which is, they need more space, it's less expensive. But so your sample, blood sample needs to travel. For that one, for example, we use integer linear programming to see if our heuristic was very good, and we could see that for small instances, our heuristic always get the optimal solution. But if you go for real, in, for real life, 
if you need some kind of heuristics. Some on location, you can use exact methods because location is a strategical decision. So if I have to make a decision, a strategical decision, I, I, can, I can have my computer run all night or I can even buy time on the supercomputer because that's the impact is so big in my business that I can do this. But for most of them, some people that don't know about metaphysics, what they do is they run the, 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 the exact methods, but they, since they didn't finish, they get a, a solution, a feasible solution that they could find in reasonable time. But usually, this feasible solution that you could find with this professional software is worse than the ones you can find with the metaphysics. Because if the metaphysics is well designed, you can be at 1% of the optimal. So how many of these problems are just plug and play, meaning that they adapt to these formulations you have shown? And how many of these require tweaking the formulation? All. Uh, let me go. Um, well, my question is related to, to the last question as well. So we've heard that um, the, most of the time is required to clean the mess of the data. But then when we go to, to the models and the algorithms uh, step, let's say, what, what takes more time? To tune the, these models or, the, or then to develop the algorithms to run them? Okay, so to... To do the models, usually, I mean, of course, it takes time. And sometimes, I'm, even with Marcelo, I'm doing this. You do a model, and you say, well, it, does not, it takes a lot of time to solve. We need to do a model. So it's a more like science work than to design the algorithm. Usually, you can design, if you have experience, you can design it quite well, because that's what researchers do. We, we build on knowledge. So if you have this knowledge, you can know, okay, for routing, oh, I know what kind of algorithm works well, I know what kind of features of this algorithm goes well. So you already know, and you don't do try and error. You already have applied one of them. Then the part that takes a lot of time is computational testing. And that's when you do a lot of time on computational testing, and then you have to really, sometimes you have to go change the model or change the algorithm. But if you have good knowledge, and, and um, for example, I'm, I, I'm in favor of something that not, most of the researchers are not in favor, which is publish negative results, which is if you have good knowledge, you can see what it works. And that's what, so for example, we become, a, you know, uh, Jessica and I, we know a lot about routing. Uh, Sara knows about scheduling. So we build this knowledge and we know what works and not works. The model, to create one model, it does not take much time. But sometimes this model does not work well when we put it on the, on the CPLEX software. So we have to test other models, things like that. Uh, how long does it take a project like this? More than a year. 
more than a year. But mostly because, especially the researchers, the PhD students, they, they should dedicate only their time to this. So, but the researchers, we do a lot of other things. So we don't dedicate full time to this. And another thing that I say a lot for business is that I don't do consulting, I do research. What's the difference between the two? So I'm, I used to have a, another example, which I use always, so probably you have, some of you have ever heard this. You want to construct a house. You go and hire someone who has experience in constructing a house, and you design the house, and you know what materials in detail. Do you want tails or do you want parquet on your floor? No, I want tails, I want parquet. Okay? They can more or less say, okay, your house takes six months to construct because they know everything. Even your house is unique. Even your house is unique. It was designed for you, but you can go. This is consulting. Your house is unique, but they know what they're doing. When you do research, you say, I want a new material that is resistant to um, earthquakes, to water, to everything. How long does it take to discover this new material? So this is research, the other is consulting. It's not worse, ni better. It's that the objectives, what you develop, the new thing is different. So, uh, so that's why sometimes it's different. And even now, the, 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 the research is becoming much, much more bureaucratic than in the past. They wanted to tell you, how much are you going to do this? It's, I don't know, I'm doing research. So. But that's the big difference. First of all, thank you for the great presentation. It's my first time here, it's a pleasure. And right now I'm writing my test proposal in routine scheduling problems. So this presentation was very valuable to me. And I wanna know what, it, what, is the, what are the reasons, in your opinion, the, the environments are, have so much resistance to apply this, this techniques to improve the logistics operations and other things like timetable in universities and general things. Okay, uh, so my opinion, I have two, two, opinion, two, two answers to that or two reasons that maybe I'm wrong or no. One of them is people don't know that exist. So my, my students in economics and business, uh, it's an it's elective. So if they didn't study this, they don't know they exist, like the doctors. And this exists? I know, I spent every, you know, three months I have spending hours, you know, reorganizing the routes for collecting. I'm, I have this, I print the maps, I've seen the maps printed. And they, she was doing like, with pencil. So the second thing is that, or maybe third, three things. Second thing is the companies that are a Using this, they're not explaining everything. Some of them is the key factor. So Amazon does not sell different products that you can buy in, in many other stores. You just have access easily to them, but the success is not because you have access to internet. The success is the way they deliver. I, I have clear, okay? In the text, you don't go to Zara. I always to say, especially the ladies, we don't go to Zara to buy a dress that no one else has. It's probably that if you buy something in Zara, you come to the university and you see three people with the same thing before you enter the university. It's what's going behind. So what's going behind, they're not explaining. And the third thing I think, in its time. This was a boon on the, after, on the 60s when everyone, these amazing people were working for the military, they were very successful. Then. Most of them went to the United States, and they were using to the United States. And then, um, and then people say, okay, we have done everything, we're going to other things, and now they are more worried about machine learning and other things. They will come. So we should be prepared for when they come. They will come. I mean, it's, 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 this is also, in management, there is a lot of, uh, uh, like, fashion waves. Now it's fashion to do this. Now it's fashion to do this. Now it's fashion to do this. So it's, uh, I think they will come because the, the saving, I mean, my experience on companies, they will say, oh, pff, this is, you know, 
you cannot do this, we cannot do this, we cannot do When you start seeing the results, you say, oh, uh, we cannot do anything without talking with, uh, about this. When they start really saving, and if you work on company, the first thing is proving that you can save them money or make their work easier, better. If you cannot do this, forget it. And be simple. Okay? We try, you, 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 we are not simple. We cannot explain things in, in, I took one hour and a half exactly, okay? Most of us, and you see a lot of talks, you have like, I've seen talks like, like 10 minutes and they bring 30 PowerPoints. I already disconnect. Immediately I, I disconnect. I start with the mobile phone, you know, looking at, okay? 